It's good to be here this morning. Amen. Good to see the congregation today, the church. Our, we find in our passage this morning there in John, take your Bible and turn there to John chapter 8 and verse 32. John chapter 8 and verse 32. Powerful text. Jesus is speaking. John 8, verse 32. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you what? Free. Free. If we've ever lived in a day and age of falsities, it's certainly... Today, amen. You see, lying, matter of fact, lying seems to be a way of life for many people in America today. Lying. And there's a book called The Book The Day America Told the Truth. A book. The Day That America Told the Truth. And in that book, the day that America told the truth, in that book, it says that 91%, did you get that, folk? 91% of those surveyed lie routinely about matters they consider trivial. 91%. And in that book, it says that 36% lie about important matters. 91% lie about trivial matters to them. And 36% lie about important matters. And 86% lied regularly to parents. 86%. 75% lie to friends. 75% lie to friends. 73% to their own siblings. 73%. To their own siblings. And 69% to spouses. Ooh, that touches home, doesn't it? By the way, just recently, my wife and I are celebrating our 36-year wedding anniversary. Yeah, I was here Tuesday night at Bible study. That was my anniversary day. Sorry, honey, God comes first. Then, my sweetheart. But you know what? 36 years. Notice 69% actually lie to their spouses. You see, when we hear those figures, perhaps it's no surprise that there is so much unhappiness in the world today. Unhappiness. Yes. Lies are easy to tell, but seldom do they help make a situation better. Easy to tell. In general, lies create mistrust and doubt. That's why we could give thanks that God doesn't lie. Yeah, somebody should say amen to that. God says what he means and means what he says. This morning... We listen as God, through the Apostle John, tells us the truth. The whole truth and nothing but 
the truth. You know, a few years ago, I was invited to be on a TV program. And they were airing this in three different TV stations just a few years ago. And uh, matter of fact, within the last three or four years, actually, up at Grand Rapids. And um, the title of the program is called The Truth and Nothing But the Truth. That's the title of the program. And it so happened that they wanted me to come on that program and speak in reference to the Sabbath. And by the way, at that time, there was a minister of, of a church, a Pentecostal church, who decided he wanted to start keeping the Sabbath. He also had been on that program. And it's interesting, see, because a false teaching, the word false teaching, false describes that which is what? A lie. The very term for false comes from the meaning of pseudo, meaning it's a lie. Now, I think if there's ever been a time we see a lot of lies going around in reference to what the Bible teaches, it's certainly now, isn't it? So I want the truth and the whole truth and nothing but the truth. You know, I'm amazed at some of the political aspects we see and uh, say, Pastor, don't go there, don't go there. But I, I'm just amazed at some of the political scenes we see today where a congressman will stand there and swear on the Bible that they're speaking the truth and nothing but the truth and the whole truth and then turn right around and lie. Yes or no? Is that true or not true? Several hundred years ago, before the birth of Jesus, there was a crucial battle that occurred between the Greeks and the Persians upon the plains of Marathon. Why doesn't that term ring a bell? Marathon? You see, the battle raged for hours. In many respects... It was a fight to the finish. Finally, the numerical inferior Greeks, the underdogs, managed a tremendous tactical win, but there was a problem. Soon the Senate, many miles away in Athens, was to vote and would most certainly ratify a treaty of appeasement. In desperation, they sent a runner in full battle gear to go the 27 miles to tell of the news. 27 miles. Now, I was in the Navy, and I saw a Navy SEAL run time, one time run 26 miles. 26 miles. This guy ran 27 miles in full gear. And that stuff they wore in those days was heavy. Really heavy. By the time the young boy got to Athens, he had run a marathon. Now do we know where the word comes from? By the way, the, the seal I'm telling you about, he did a marathon. He ran through water. He went up the mountains. He did all kinds of terrain. He swam. And what do we call that today? A marathon. You don't just run. You do all kinds of different things. But watch what happened. It is said that he was totally spent. That he literally ran himself to death. In his exhaustion, he was able to utter only one word to the Athanathians. One word. Victory. 
victory. As you might have expected, that one word made all the difference in the world when the senators voted whether or not to accept that treaty of appeasement. In a sense, the apostles are like that soldier who ran to deliver the good news. Look at the lives of the apostles. They went to their death sharing the good news. You see, the apostles, they were eyewitnesses to the events of Jesus' life. They watched as Jesus stood alone on the spiritual battlefield against the temptations of the devil and the evils of this world. They saw him hang on that cross in humility, looking like one who had been taken captive. A prisoner of war. I had a buddy who was in the Green Bray, a prisoner of war in Vietnam. POW. You see, they watched as he took his last breath, certain that this battle had ended in defeat. But in the morning, they became the eyewitnesses to the truth of it all. They saw the empty tomb. And for the next 40 days, you could read it in Acts chapter 1, verse 3. For the next 40 days, they saw the risen Jesus on numerous occasions. Thomas even had the chance with his very own hands to touch the places where the nails had punctured Jesus' flesh and where the spear had pierced his side. While the political spin doctors were concocting their own story to hide the truth about what had happened early that morning, the apostles delivered the truth. They declared that he is indeed true God and true man with the Father from all eternity, but also born of the Virgin Mary. He is the living word of of God. They proclaimed that God's plan of salvation had reached its culmination and conclusion in one person, Jesus Christ. How could they be so sure? Because he was not dead. But he had risen, just as he said. The eternal Son of God came to win the victory. Amen to that. Over Satan and offer eternal life to all his people. Yes. You see, that's the testimony they spent their lives delivering. That's the testimony they continue to share with us today through the scriptures. They testify to Christ's victory. You know, there's a dear old hymn that sticks in my heart. I wished I could sing. I thank the Lord at least I could try to play saxophone. And Don helps me out as he plays and and that too, and say, you know, there's victory, that old hymn, there's victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He walks with me. Now, isn't that, isn't that the Jesus we're talking about here? Gives us victory. Amen. They testify to Christ's victory because that means Satan's strange hold and stranglehold has been broken. We no longer have to live lives as slaves to the evil of this world. We have been set free to live lives in service to our good and gracious God. That's the truth. The whole truth and nothing but the truth from the mouths of eyewitnesses. Listen to it. 
But don't stop there. This testimony is more than just fun facts to wow your friends with while you're playing trivial pursuit. The testimony, this testimony, is truth to live by. One of the greatest complaints from those outside the church against those who are church members is that they are all hypocrites. You ever heard that one before? People say, well, but I don't go to that church because they're all hypocrites. It is certainly possible that this is one of many misguided excuses for staying away from church, but is it possible that we sometimes help promote that view? Is that possible? Are we the ones whom the apostles address when he warns against saying one thing and doing the opposite when he says, if we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. That's biblical. You see, there's an example of this kind of behavior that is told about rather pompous looking deacon who was endeavoring to impress upon a class of boys the importance of living the Christian life. Why do people call me Christian? The man asked. After a moment's pause, one of the youngsters said, maybe it's because they don't know you. <laughs> <laughs> I heard ouch clear up here. Heard, yeah. Perhaps it would be good if we ask ourselves the same question. Why do people call you Christian? Is it just because you hold formal membership of a Christian church? Would they have trouble calling you Christian if they saw the way you lived during the week? Or do people recognize you as Christian because the words you speak on Sabbath morning also match with the way you live your life all week long? God wants us to live by the truth every hour of every day of every week, both in word and action for the entire world to view. We speak of world views. How does the world look at Christians? I think the world is full of nominal Christians. What do you say? You know, that's one reason Islam does not accept Christianity. And we normally think of radical Islam that dies for their faith. But one of the principles of Islam for not accepting Christianity is the fact that they are thinking, if you were to live the Christian life, I would, I would do that. Live what you believe, and that would be much more effective. Don't you think? You see, if we're going to display this truth outwardly, then we have to be truthful about what continues to cling to us inwardly. This kind of examination requires an honest evaluation of ourselves. Not me evaluating you, nor you evaluating me, but an evaluation of ourselves. Skirting the issue won't help solve the problem. Oh, we could say, well, you know all churches that way. There's always going to be somebody that's that way. Skirting the issue won't help solve the problem. Stubbornness to admit the truth or willful ignorance of the truth does not lead us to bliss. You know the old cliche, what you don't know won't hurt you. You've heard that. Is that really true? You know, the Lord says himself, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Nor do these things change the truth 
that we are sinful people. Maybe we can learn a lesson from a gentleman who was having a philosophical argument with President Lincoln. Some of you may have heard this argument before. It's, it's sometimes interesting to go through some of these museums. Lincoln said this. President Lincoln said, now this was a philosophical argument that President Lincoln had with this individual. And Lincoln, President Lincoln said, he asked this question, he said, well, let's see how many legs a cow has. Have you ever heard this argument before? So President Lincoln was challenged with this philosopher. So he says, well, let's see how many legs has a cow. Four, of course, came the reply disgustedly from the philosopher. Four. That's right, agreed President Lincoln. Now suppose, President Lincoln's asking the next question, and he asks this philosopher, he says, now suppose you call the cow's tail a leg. How many legs would the cow have? Why five, of course, the philosopher was competent in reply. President Lincoln responded, now that's where you're wrong. Calling a cow's tail a leg doesn't make it a leg. Calling sin a minor error, calling sin a mistake, calling sin a pet vice doesn't make it any less sinful, does it? You know, there's... There's a lot of preachers today that won't even touch the idea of sin. You know that, don't you? When we fail to recognize our own sinfulness, we are only fooling ourselves. Ignorance, ignorance about our own sinfulness leaves us in the bleak situation that John describes in Chapter 1 and verse 8. Here's what he says. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth. Now, what is this sermon about today? The truth. Because you see, friends, Jesus said the truth will set you free. Now, in order to deal with the truth, we have to first examine our own selves. You see, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. When we fail to recognize our own sinfulness, we put ourselves in a precarious position, as John says. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word has no place in our lives. You see, sin is sin. Whether that sin is murder or hatred, stealing or coveting, idolatry or lust, because that is what God has told us. God means what he says and says what he means. To say otherwise is to tell the judge who presides over the affairs of heaven and earth, who decides your guilt or innocence for eternity, that he is a liar. I don't know about you, but... I don't think that it is ever a good idea to make the judge your enemy when you are on trial and he controls your verdict. I got a friend, I'm sure he won't mind me telling this story. He's a retired police officer over around the Flint area and he has seen some bad stuff. You know, at one time Flint had a high murder Population. Well, my friend was a police officer in Flint. And he tells me the story, and I laughed so hard I couldn't believe it. But I can't do justice to tell you the story that was his like he can. But you could get a, a picture of this story. He and his buddy police officer just got off duty, and 
There at the police station, they have a locker and they change their clothes into civilian clothes. And they headed out and, and my police officer buddy and his buddy, they had this car that was kind of like, you know, like it would run. And they pull up to a red light. They stop. And right next to them pulls up a car of six guys that are gang members. They're sitting at the light, side by side. And all of a sudden, one of the gang members decided to take a beer bottle and throw it out the window and hit their car. Uh-oh. That didn't go over too well. The light changed, and these gang members, they squeal off. Well, of course, these guys are following them. They turn.